It's March, my friends, and that means it is time to really start thinking about what you want in your garden this year. So myself, Jacques, and Meg have compiled nine interesting picks for March that you can start planting right now. And spoiler alert, some of them, maybe even all, are actually in the garden behind me right now. My first pick is one that it's absolutely one of my favorite plants. I've grown it in just about every way you can imagine. And it's in this garden right now, even though I didn't plant it yet, and that would be the potato. Potatoes are quintessential. It's a love language, really. It's, a, it's an entire ethos and philosophy of life, one that I wholeheartedly subscribe to. I tried to live off these bad boys for about a month. I lost like 10 pounds. It was probably 10 pounds of muscle. I don't even think I lost any fat. So certainly some trials and tribulations, but you can grow them in just about any soil, in just about any type of system. In ground, like I have done here, in a five gallon bucket, in a grow bag, or in a raised bed. If you wanna get intrepid and try growing them from seed, we do stock a variety called the Clancy Potato, which is super fun to try, but most people grow them from seed potatoes. With potatoes, you can purchase seed potatoes. We really like Wood Prairie Farms for that. Or you can go grab organic potatoes from the grocery store and wait until they chit, which is a weird word that basically just means from the eyes, you get these little sprouts. From there, you can toss them about six inches down into the soil and let them come up pretty much on autopilot. Potatoes are actually what's called a pioneer crop, meaning you can throw them in relatively unimproved soil. And not only will they grow well, they'll actually help the rest of the garden grow even better once you plant something else in that spot. But what you'll see is a little bit of green growth coming up, much like you see right here. This is maybe about a month old worth of growth. It'll take about two more months. You'll see this get nice and bushy. It'll start to yellow. It'll start to die. And then once it's fully dead, you wait about two weeks and dig your potatoes up and you have a beautiful meal. When you begin gardening, one of the best pieces of advice you could get is to grow what you love to eat. For us here in our home, it is brassicas. That is things like broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower. And actually, these are a wonderful crop because they could be harvested two different times of the year for us here in San Diego. That is the fall winter garden where I could actually produce these massive cabbages and cauliflower heads like this. And there is the spring garden which starts now. So let me show you some of my favorite varieties that grow no matter where you live. One of my favorite cabbages has become the Copenhagen market cabbage. And that is actually what this big boy is right here. Usually they are a little bit more compact, but this one has been getting tons of winter rain. You can grow them in spring in most of the country and they will do quite well regardless of where you live. The next pick is the twister cauliflower. This is one that self wraps and also can grow well in the heat. The self wrapping protects the head from turning a yellowish or purple color due to the sun. And the fact that it could tolerate heat is great for warmer climates like me in zone 10B San Diego, where you don't know if spring's gonna actually stay cool and nice like it is today or get very hot and miserable and ruin your brassica harvest. So that is also why I actually recommend the Checo for my broccoli choice. This is one that can tolerate heat, will produce a wonderful nice big head at the beginning, and then make wonderful side shoot florets all summer long that will be quite delicious until you get to the very, very actually true unbearable hot period of the year. So those are my picks for brassicas. They should do well no matter where you live, and they also happen to all be delicious. Companion planting is always a buzz phrase in the world of gardening, and for good reason. I mean, why wouldn't you want to learn which plants you can plant that actually help deter pests on your crops. Enter marigolds and nasturtiums. Not only are these two gorgeous, stunning flowers, they are your garden BFFs. If you've ever been walking through a garden center and you smell something that just kind of makes you stop and go, you're probably smelling the beautiful stench of a marigold. And although they're a little bit smelly, that's kind of good for us because just like we stick up our noses to the smell, so do a lot of pests. And a lot of pests really try to avoid anything that's planted near marigold because they just can't take the smell. And I don't blame them one bit. They're beautiful, but they stink. Not only can they deter pests above ground, but they emit this chemical in their roots that can help deter things underground like root knot nematodes, which can be really harmful to tomato plants. So that's why I always, always, always make sure to plant marigolds with my tomatoes. Keep in mind that there are a few different types of marigolds. We've got French marigolds and African marigolds. Both of them are just as stinky, but if you're looking to deter those root knot nematodes around your tomatoes, you wanna go with the French variety because they produce much more of that chemical than the African variety. Nasturtiums are considered a companion plant because they act kind of like a trap crop. It's the opposite of marigolds. 
everyone loves nasturtiums. Pests love them, pollinators love them. My chickens love nasturtium leaves. That's like their all time favorite treat ever. And what this can do is it draws the pest attention to your nasturtiums rather than your precious edible crops. Nasturtiums are also one of my favorites to plant as a border plant because they're just so beautiful. And if you get a variety like this trailing variety, you can plant them in, say you have a raised bed. If you plant them on the border, they just trail and cascade over and it's just so beautiful. Highly, highly recommend these. Both marigolds and nasturtiums can be direct sown right into the garden after your last frost, or you can go ahead and get a head start on their blooming cycle and start them now indoors. My next pick I never thought would be a pick ever for me because historically I'm an edibles guy. Back in the day I used to say, why would you grow anything that you can't eat? Which is a silly, silly assumption, but I've become enchanted, really, by flowers. I've been trying to learn design, I've been trying to learn all sorts of different flower starting techniques. So my pick for you is Linaria. Linaria is a sleeper pick for me. I am honestly enchanted by the flowers. They look completely gorgeous. It's known as a mini snapdragon. It has another name, toad flax. I don't really like those. I kind of like Linaria as the name. This one's called Fairy Bouquet. Why? Because you've got this color here, I'm partially colorblind, it's hard for me to tell, but that feels like a purple emotionally to me. You've got this sort of lightish pink periwinkle, you've got a yellow, so a nice little mix here. But the thing about flowers, and something I had to learn when I first started growing them, is the germination times tend to be a little bit longer. This one's 10 to 20 days, and they tend to be very weirdly shaped seeds. They're either uh, oddly shaped or just tiny, and Linaria is the latter. They're very small seeds. You want to sow them in clumps every about four inches or so and just press them down into the soil. These are transplantable. So if you're starting in March, you can start them in a indoor setup and then just transplant them out. Or if you want to get crazy as Meg likes to do, you can just take the seeds and do a little bit of chaos gardening, but they bring such a beautiful sort of dainty fairy-ish type of vibe to the rest of my edible vegetable garden here. I have my onions, my brassicas, and then my Linaria peeking out. It gives a little bit of spring color. So to me, it's actually gonna be something I plant for many, many years to come in my garden. One of my favorite things to consider when I'm planting my garden is actually the height and textures of my space. Right here you can see I have a very nice low alyssum growing next to the zeolites calendula. Together they create texture and also variation in height. But as we approach spring, I have my one true favorite flower that I look forward to its blooms every single year, and that is the sunflower. They provide so many different colors, so many different textures, and also so many benefits to your garden. So I'm gonna share some of my favorite varieties and also give you a tip on how to grow that true giant sunflower you've always been chasing. The first two sunflowers I wanna share with you guys are Lemon Queen and Evening Sun. These are both multi-branching sunflowers. Multi-branching sunflowers will produce multiple branches that will produce flowers instead of just a single stalk that once it blooms, it's done. So you'll get longer continuous blooms, multiple blooms, and a ton of texture from all these different flower stalks poking out all over the place. Two wonderful varieties that I highly encourage you grow. Now, if you want a single, really tall height element that is a focal point in your garden, you can't go wrong with the Mongolian giant. It's going to produce one gigantic head and then it's done. So it's not going to last as long, but it's very interesting to see that huge flower. And of course you could eat the seeds from it. Now, here's the tip. If you are growing sunflowers, just so you know, you totally can transplant them from seedlings. The thing is, is that they might not end up reaching their true potential. So if I put these in here, I will know that I'll have them, which is great because now I could walk around my garden, fill in any empty spots as these are ready to go. But if I want that true, true giant, I'm going to want to take the seed from my Mongolian giant here and place it directly in the ground. That's because they have a taproot and that taproot can get disturbed during transplanting. What that means is basically it's not going to die, but it's not going to reach its full potential. So if you want the truly magnificent, gigantic sunflower, plant the seed directly in ground, give it plenty of water at the beginning, and you'll get that actual giant. Trying to imagine a life without fresh garden pesto or a crispy, crunchy dill pickle, it makes me very sad. Like honestly, I could probably start to tear up if I think too hard about it, but that is why herbs like basil and dill are always on my list of things to plant. Basil is one of those versatile herbs that have so many different varieties that you can choose from. And as a basil enthusiast, I want to try to grow them all. But one variety that I grew last year really stuck out to me, and it's this Everleaf Emerald Towers Basil. This is a really great culinary variety. It makes delicious pesto, but the 
reason that it sticks out to me is because it's a slow bolting variety. And as a Southern gardener, I know the importance of having slow bolting herbs. Bolting just means that that herb has gone to flower and when you are growing herbs for culinary purposes, usually we're eating the leaves, we're not eating the flowers. So we want to prolong that flowering as long as possible. Last year, this variety didn't bolt on me until late October, which was really impressive because it went the entire growing season without bolting. Usually with other varieties, you plant them and then two or three weeks later, they already start bolting. So this variety is always gonna stay in my basil rotation. Dill is another one of those herbs that gets major points for versatility because not only can it be used for culinary purposes, but it attracts pollinators and beneficial insects like crazy. And it's also one of the host plants for the Eastern Black Swallowtail Butterfly, which I raise every single year. And this variety, it's called Tetra. This is another slow bolting variety, which is really important for us Southern gardeners. But even when dill bolts, it's actually not that big of a deal because their flower heads are delicious and they can still be used in pickles and other recipes. Both of these are easy to grow and I like to start them indoors right now in seed trays just so I can get a head start, get some plants established so that I can go ahead and start harvesting these herbs to cook with in early spring. But you can also wait until after your last frost and just direct sow them right into the garden. It's actually really hard to grow protein in the garden, at least quickly, unless you grow the pick that I'm about to share with you. I have three for you, and it's one that I've grown in the ground, I've grown it in vertical systems, I've grown it in containers. It is the wonderful and wild world of beans. So funnily enough, people in my area of the world didn't even start eating beans until about 300 AD, and in Northeast USA, we probably didn't start eating beans as a people until about like 1100 or 1200 or so, mostly because they're dry and they need to be cooked to provide any real nutritional value. So someone figured that out. Some intrepid soul decided, hey, I'm gonna throw some beans in this pot of stew that I'm making and I'm actually gonna eat them. And it's that protein, it's that umami flavor that those beans provide that kind of gives the body the sense, hey, I should really keep eating this. There's some good nutrition in here. They're so productive in the garden, guys. So three picks for you. If you're in a colder climate, Royal Burgundy might be a pick, or if you're in small spaces, it tends to do better in a cold climate, tends to do really well in a container. It's a purple bean, it is hard to go wrong. And if you wanna get a little bourgeoisie with me, you've got French filet, which is known as Heracot Vert. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not French. And if you're French, I'm sorry. This is the quintessential French bean. So if you really like that vibe, I would grow these. Then you've got Gold Rush if you just wanna get a little bit fun and a little bit more spicy with the color. But all these really grown in the exact same manner. Direct sowing beans is a good idea. Growing them in ground or containers, just pop them about an inch deep, water them, they'll come up. But you can start them in seedling trays or pots of any kind. You'll notice that these ones are doing quite well. They might be a little bit leggy, but all you really wanna do is bury them to about there. When that first node of growth starts to branch off, just put them about that deep. What you'll notice if you are transplanting beans is they tend to yellow a bit post-transplant. It takes about one or two weeks or so, so maybe you could throw a little nitrogen fertilizer in there to help them out, because they are nitrogen fixers, but they need to kind of get that system up and running to steal that atmospheric nitrogen so they actually can start cycling that for themselves. So you give them a little bit at the start that tends to help the transplant issue, but beans are just so productive. They're about 50, 60 days to maturity, but if you wanna keep beans going throughout the spring, throughout the summer, just plant them every one or two weeks and keep cycling those plants and make sure you keep harvesting them because they'll keep producing if you do. I'm down here surrounded by green plants and one of these is actually one of my favorite things to harvest out of the garden and March is a fantastic time to start it. It's delicious, it's sweet, it's crunchy. And when you grow it yourself, it is so much fun to pull straight out of the ground. And that of course is the carrot. Now a lot of people struggle with germination when it comes to carrots, meaning getting them to even start growing. So let me give you some tips on how to get the best germination possible so you could have the, your own sea of green. And also a couple varieties I really like to grow. Before I give you the tips on how to get the best possible germination, I wanted to call out two of my favorite fun varieties. First one is called Little Fingers, which is aptly named because it makes these little carrots that are quite delicious. And we also have the Tonda de Pragi, which I probably mispronounced very poorly. 
which is a funny kind of beet shaped carrot. Both of these also do really wonderfully in containers since they're not as big and they both taste wonderful and are actually a little bit faster to harvest than most larger carrots. So let's get into the tips on how you can succeed to grow carrots at home. First thing you want to do number one by far is to make sure that wherever you're growing them it is very well watered we're talking full saturation so step one is going to be watering the soil moisture is extremely important because it is the thing that actually kills carrot germination they take 10 to 14 days to germinate and if they dry out for a single one of those days they failed so you want to make sure you start off with very nice wet soil next thing i'm going to do here is create a little furrow which is just a little channel that i'm going to carve in with my hand on this irrigation line and this one as well. The way I like to seed the carrots once I have my channels ready is to pinch the packet. So I create a nice little ridge there and that allows the carrots to fall a little bit more slowly. Then all I have to do is tap on the top of my hand and the seed will fall right down. You can overseed a little bit, but you're going to want to go through and remove carrots until they're, I don't know, maybe about an inch space between each carrot. Once we have the carrot seed in our trench, we're going to go ahead and very lightly bury it. We're not going to bury it deeply because these are small seeds. And that's all you really want to do is basically just make sure the seed is covered. And then you're going to want to press them in to make sure the seed is touching that wet soil. Hit it with another round of water right into that channel. And then here's the secret sauce to getting good carrot germination. You're going to want to grab something like cardboard, burlap, even large leaves from your plants totally work. You're going to take it, place it right over where you planted your carrot seeds, and then you're gonna water the surface of that material. By placing the cardboard on top of your soil, you're going to slow the evaporation dramatically. And remember, if that carrot seed dries out for a single day, it's toast. So you wanna make sure that it is still wet underneath. Give it a peek every once in a while, make sure the soil looks nice and damp. And after about 10 days to 14 days, you're going to start seeing sprouts. As soon as you see the sprouts, get rid of the cardboard and marvel at your perfect rows of carrots and perfect germination. These next picks are two medicinal powerhouses and I always make sure that I'm growing them and keeping them well stocked in my home. We have turmeric and ginger. Turmeric and ginger are in the same family so they can be grown the exact same way and they are rhizomaceous plants which means that they grow and propagate through these underground stems called rhizomes, which is the part of the plant that we eat. While these are tropical plants that really appreciate a long, warm, and humid growing season, you can try to get away with growing them in colder climates if you start them indoors right now and just go ahead and get a head start on growing them. You most certainly can plant ginger and turmeric from your grocery store. I would just suggest getting them organic. Um, I got these from Whole Foods and you want to make sure you're getting organic because some of the non-organic ones are sprayed with this growth inhibitor and they spray that on them so that they don't sprout while they're sitting on the shelves. So for something that we are actively trying to sprout, we wanna make sure that there's none of that growth inhibitor on there. So just make sure that you get organic and you should be good to go. Before we plant them, we are just going to break them off into sections. And we're gonna make sure that each section has at least one of these eyes. This is much like when you are growing potatoes because the eye is where the shoots come out of. So just make sure that it has one or more eyes present. Once you have your pieces, it's a good idea to just leave them sitting out for a day or two so that these cuts can callus over and that'll just prevent them from rotting in the soil. There are several ways that you can plant your ginger and turmeric. If you live in a warmer climate where they are considered perennials and they will come back every year, you can go ahead and plant them in ground or in a garden bed. But for you all that live in colder climates, you might want to consider growing them in containers. And I'm kind of in a middle zone. Legend has it that we can grow them as perennials here, um, but I'm not really sure. I haven't tried yet. I've always grown them in containers because I thought that it wasn't possible to grow them as perennials here. But this year I'm going to do some experimenting and try to grow them as a perennial and We'll see how that works out. But they grow really well in containers and that's how I've grown them for the last three years. And if you're in a colder climate, you can kind of grow them as a perennial if you take them indoors over the winter. You can break these apart into like the smallest pieces that you can with one eye each and you can start them in seed trays or like small pots if you want. But I prefer to just go ahead and plant them out where they're gonna grow. So I am just planting them right into the grow bag. This is a 10 gallon grow bag and I've already prepped it with a little bit of compost. And I've found over the past few years that two pieces is pretty much your sweet spot 
with how much you want to plant in a 10 gallon. When we plant the rhizomes, we're going to plant them about two to three inches deep and we're going to leave them horizontal, flat like this when we plant. Just stick them in there and cover them up. Same goes with this one. Going to plant it horizontal in the soil like that and just cover it up. You wanna keep your ginger moist until they start to sprout and my grow bag is gonna hang out into the greenhouse until it's warm enough to bring it outside. And But when I do bring it outside, I'm gonna keep it in partial shade because I've found that ginger likes sun, but it doesn't like excessive sun. And here in zone 8A, we get a lot of excessive sun. So it always does best for me in partial shade. In about eight months or so, you might notice that your ginger's leaves are starting to die back and the plant is trying to go dormant for the winter. And if you're growing in containers, you have a few options. You can either harvest most or all of your ginger if you want, or you can leave some and you can bring it inside to over winter. Um, what I prefer to do, what I've done for the past few years is I will just harvest all of it. I'll bring it inside. I will preserve it any way that I can. I make um, powder with it. I will dehydrate it for tea or you can also freeze it. It does really well being frozen. And then I will restart the next year. Something I've done this year is create a border patch where I have actually most of the selections that we shared with you today, including these sunflowers, which if you want a full guide on how to grow, you can check this video out right there. Good luck in the garden, my friends, and keep on growing.